There's hardly a subject in the world about which more speculative theories have been advanced than the second coming of Jesus Christ. You don't have to wait too long before you hear somebody telling you they know when he's coming or the Lord spoke to them or some angel came and said he's coming at a certain, certain time and whatever. And there are some people that say Jesus is not coming back at all. It's just a hodgepodge of trouble is what it is because it teaches nothing that the Bible does. I don't know why that is such a difficult thing, but then when I think of the other teachings of the Bible that are quite simple, that people do to human doctrines that they're trying to force the Bible to support and do the same thing with those doctrines as they do with the second coming of Christ. Jesus often spoke of his second coming. John 14, 3, he said, I, I come again. And then even in instituting the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, Paul said that Christ had said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death till he come. And when you look at the apostles of Christ, they all preached and wrote of his second coming. And I try sometimes just to go through and note how many times it's alluded to. They lived with the reality that he was coming. They didn't know any more than we do about when he was going to come, but they believed he would. And whether you're living in A.D. 70 or whether you're living now or any time in between, it's still just as real when you know what the Bible said and Christ said you couldn't know the exact date of his coming, but he said, I'm coming. He certainly stayed true to all the other promises he's made. When it came to his first coming, thousands of years went by as the promise was shown over and over again that there would be a way through a Messiah that man would be saved. And he kept that promise. I think so many times one of the things that hinders us is the fact that we still think of God limited by time and space as we are. If he said he's coming and he waits 100 years, that's too long, this kind of thing. And yet we just must learn what the Bible has to say about deity and that time has no bearing at all on him. First of all, let's look a little bit at the manner of our Lord's coming. When he had said these things, he's speaking to his apostles, as they were looking, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who was received up into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye beheld him going into heaven. Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. Well, that's in the historical section of the New Testament right after that section that pertains to the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is just before, of course, there is the record of the establishment of the Lord's church in the next chapter, Acts 2. But then we come down to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 1 and verse 7. And we have, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they that pierced him. Well, his ascension to heaven was in person. And his coming back the second time is going to be in person. It's not going to be some sort of apparition or some sort of ghost or spirit. It won't be representatively through someone else. But the same Jesus Christ who ascended will come again. His second advent will be different from his first advent. first one, he was a very humble person. 
He was a person who was a man of sorrows. He was rejected, Scripture says, and he was prophesied. He was prophesied of him in Isaiah 53 in verse number 3. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then later he said he came unto his own, his own received him not, verse 11 of John 1. And they that were his own received him not. Those that should have received him were taught, having had his, they are called the lively oracles committed unto them over 1,500 years, besides the patriarchal age preceding that. All those things developing the scheme of redemption, but they didn't believe him, Matthew 25, 31 through 32. But when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the angels with him, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. Now just reading those two passages, look at the difference in the way he appeared in his first coming and in the way he is described in coming the second time. Completely different appearance. He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords and glorified and to judge the world. The first time he came, he came as the great physician. He came as the good shepherd. He came as the Savior. He came with mercy. He came, and of course, we have the gospel, the good news of Christ, that salvation, as we sometimes sing, has been brought down. The gospel is God's power to save. But at the end of the age, at the end of this Christian dispensation, the end of all things material and uh, having to do with time, then it will be a different Christ who's appearing. There won't be anybody that will reject the Christ when he comes the second time. He will be considered and known as the Son of God. Man will not have an opportunity to say, all right, I see now, I'll, I'll change. No, that's, that's too late when he comes the second time. The scripture reads in 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense affliction to them that afflict you. And then he says, And to you who are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with the angel of his power and flaming fire, rendering vengeance to them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. I don't think language could be clearer. It's a time of retribution. It's a time of vengeance. Jesus made it clear when he's on this earth that God holds vengeance to himself. We're not to exact vengeance because he knows all that's knowable. He knows all the motives of the heart. He knows every little thing there is. He doesn't have to come to know the facts in the case. He knows the facts in the case. We recognize that when Jesus came the first time, there were many people who didn't know him or believe him. But that will not be the case when he comes the second time. The scripture reads, Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in their graves shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. American standards is judgment. Again, John 5, 28 through 29. The idea of judgment when he comes again is a meeting out of sentence. When we die, the jury is in and it pronounces us saved or lost because we've finished our course here and we've either taking advantage of the opportunities to obey Christ, to become a Christian, be faithful to him, or we haven't. So the day is coming when we will stand before him in judgment. There are those people, of course, concerning the second coming of Christ who still try to teach and do teach that he is coming sort of secretly, and that the scriptures clearly show that's not the case, is when he says, all shall hear his voice. All, no one's left out. All shall hear his voice. Everyone will hear. Well, that means even those that are physically dead will hear. 
Then the scripture reads in Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, as we read, and every eye shall see him and they that pierced him. You say, well, I don't know how that can happen. Well, (laughs) I don't know how a lot of things happen. I I still don't know how God said, let there be light, and there was light. And a whole host of things in the Bible that involve God. But it happened. Thus, it will happen at the end of the world where God will arrange all those things. If he could uh, open up the Red Sea, free Israel from Egyptian bondage. If he could, when the feet, the soles of the feet of the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant touch the swollen, roaring waters of Jordan, and they all stopped on one side and ran off down the other so that all those thousands and thousands of Israelites go across on dry ground. I just don't question these things. I mean, what kind of God do we serve as you question him on working these things out? He could bring everything we see into existence here just by speaking it. And he upholds all of it, Hebrews says, by the word of his power. When Jesus comes again, everyone will see him. And he says, even those that pierced him are crucified him. So his second coming will be heard. His second coming will be seen by every person on earth, whether living or dead. And that's quite an amazing sight. As a child of God, striving to be faithful every day of my life, I want to see that. I want to see that. People talk about all sorts of things to see. Well, here's one I know I will see, and so will everybody else. The time of his coming, of course, has been guessed at. Some people, as I said earlier, have tried to say, well, we can tell you when he's coming. Especially this happened in the 19th century. Back in 1843, it was predicted of Mr. Miller that he would come. Well, the time he set passed, he didn't come, so he said he made some miscalculations. So he said for the next year, 1844, well, guess what happened? He didn't come. If you go on through the study of religious history of the United States, they set dates like in 1881, 1889, 1896 were dates that were set, Uh, even 1934, and on down the line, right up until recent years, Christ is coming. Jehovah's Witnesses try to say that he came in 1914, but nobody saw him. (laughs) I don't know how they handle some of this stuff, and they won't give you a chance to put them on the spot to see how they handle it. But nevertheless, whatever they do, if it contradicts these plain scriptures we've already read, it can't be right. So we need to understand that. The things that are of earthly importance, I guarantee you at that time, won't seem to be important at all. Our Lord said it plainly. And anyone who claims to believe him should know the truth on it. No one on earth can ever know the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Our Lord said plainly in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. It's in God's mind when that's going to happen. But he hadn't told it to us. And no man's going to come up and say anything. No angel's going to come down here and whisper it in somebody's ear or announce it from the housetops for that matter. I don't know how anybody can say this Bible is the word of God. We ought to love it and study it and turn around and speak right contrary to it. Nobody knows when the Lord's coming. Jesus says this, Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Verse 44. That just tells me that as things are moving right along today as usual on this Sunday, then if he comes, he'll be here. Or if it's tomorrow, whatever it is, everything will be functioning right along, and he's here. It's that fast as far as the way he describes his coming. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, 2 Peter 3.10. Well, we don't know when the thief's coming, and thus that's the point. Paul uses the same expression to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 2 when he exhorts, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, 
he would have watched and would, have suffered, would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 42 through 44. I pause here and say the emphasis here should be live faithful all day long every day. And you're ready. So the time of the second coming of the Lord is known only to God. The angels don't know, and yet there's still gullible, gullible people who will not understand that. I would simply say that anyone who makes predictions of his coming is just simply a false teacher. That's all there is to it. I think I told you about the time back when this was debated pretty hotly in the 1930s and earlier. Brother Foy Wallace with everybody that wanted fast travel from one point to another and rode the trains. And he was sitting in the cars. They rode along. And a man came down the aisle declaring that the Lord was coming at a certain time. Brother Wallace was holding his Bible, reading it. When the man went by, he got up and put his Bible down the floor, pretended to jump up and down on it, and shocked everybody in the car, but especially the man declaring he knew exactly when he was coming. Well, the man tried to say, don't do that. That's the word of God. We ought to respect it. He said, well, I just found out this book's a liar, and that shocked folks even more. He said, this book says that nobody knows when he's coming, and you just told us when he was coming. Well, the point is, of course, was made. The Bible doesn't tell us when he's coming. To get ready for his coming is to obey the gospel and be faithful all day long every day. It doesn't make any difference when the heavens split and he comes then. You're ready. There are going to be some things he won't do when he comes. There are all sorts of things I'd like to know about the details of all of that, but I'm not going to know until I'm there. I want to look at some of the things here. He's not coming again to die for our sins. I think everybody here would know that. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. So Christ also having been once offered to bear the sins of many, now listen, shall appear a second time apart from sin to them that wait for him unto salvation. Hebrews 9, 27. 28. Waiting on the Lord to perform his promises is part of what is meant about being patient. Patience is you keep doing what you know is right, trusting the promises, no matter what kind of pressures are put on you. You see, all the persecution Satan can put against us, however they may come, does not change the promises of the Lord. And the idea of patience is bearing up under a burden as you continue to do what's right. He's not coming again to give anybody a second chance. If you don't take advantage of this time period, this state of probation man is in, to obey the gospel, there's not a second chance. I'm quite sure on that day that people will be screaming and yelling right to left about save me. I do get a little bit of a picture of the judgment when they said, Lord, Lord, did we not do this, that, and the other? You notice he never argues with them. He just condemns them. The Lord, if you notice, just doesn't argue with folks like that. And even when you look at some things as you study the book of Acts, when he tells people to do something, he doesn't say, well, okay, you don't understand. Let's sit down and have a... Uh, a discussion session. He just turns around basically and says, go, do it. We must recognize that the end of all things brings everything to the judgment because he's coming as king of king and lord of lords, 1 Timothy 6.15. He's not coming to set up his kingdom and reign in Jerusalem or anywhere else over it because he's already reigning has been for almost 2,000 years. Peter and the other apostles declared him to be sitting at the right hand of God and reigning. Well, if he's reigning, he has a kingdom. One of the things about a kingdom, and it has to have a king, and a king reigns, and a king can't reign over what is not there, 
and that has to be a kingdom. So that's just one of the old things that premillennialism has come up with. It's foreign to the truth of God as many other tenets of that faith are. Scripture reads, then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God. Not set it up, but deliver it up. Even the Father, when he shall have abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26. Now I don't know what it will be like when the end comes, the judgment day is over. The saved people in glorified form are in heaven. And Christ is not ruling as the king because he's put down all rule and all authority when he delivered up the kingdom to God. I don't understand all that, but if I live faithful here, there's one guarantee. I will understand it as well as I'm capable of understanding anything in eternity if I'll be faithful here. Death will be completely abolished. Can you conceive of living in a world now where there's no death? I can't. It's all around us. We're part of it. It's working on all of us sooner or later. But it'll be abolished when he comes. He'll raise the dead. All that'll happen when Christ comes a second time, John 5, 28 and 29. That's when he's going to deliver up the kingdom to God. He's reigning now, let me emphasize again. And he will continue to reign. And that little word till, T-I-L-L, comes up, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Because when the end comes and they're raised and the judgment takes place, he delivers up the kingdom of God. So instead of beginning to reign when he comes the second time, he's going to cease his reign and deliver up the kingdom to the Father. Which I understood better about that, but I don't. One purpose of his coming is stated in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. All that are in their graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Now the Apostle Paul wrote this, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Then he said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now think about that for a moment. There's that shout that's going to be heard worldwide. The trump of God sounds at the same time. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, I don't understand all that. That means those now dead in the Hadean world who died faithful, they're coming with him. But then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and add Paul's writing in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. We know all that happens for those alive on earth in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump. May I remind you, the twinkling of the eye is not a blink of the eye. It has the sunlight glints across your eyeball that fast. There's no time, no time to uh, really realize anything's happened until it's happened. He's going to raise the dead then in his second coming, both the righteous and the wicked, John 5, 28 and 29. But when he gets through with that, you realize death, physical death, is no more. Another purpose of his second coming, as I've already alluded to and you well know, is to judge the world. Wherefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the heart, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Well, now you might say that makes the Bible contradict itself because we've been told to judge righteous judgment. And here he says, judge nothing. That's yeah, the nature of the judgment. He has to be talking about two different kinds of judgment. We're not to judge according to the way things appear to us. We're to judge... Righteous judgment. Well, all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. 
we judge as to what's right and wrong on the basis of what Christ has taught us. I only know of one reason that a person must be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's in order to receive remission of sins. Well, how can I stand solid for that and against anything contrary to it? Because I know what the Bible says. It's that simple. And on those things necessary to our salvation, we can stand rock solid on those things. So the judgment seen in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, begins with these words. But when the Son of Man shall come in his glory... And then continues with a description of the separation of the righteous from the wicked. And these sentences are imposed. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But then to those who are not saved, depart from me, ye cursed, into the eternal fire or everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice he doesn't come, when he does come the second time, he comes as Savior to those who prepared themselves by belief and obedience to the gospel here to face him then. But to those who didn't prepare themselves by using their lives here to learn the truth and live accordingly, then he will be sentencing them to depart the everlasting fires of torment. Paul wrote, we must all be manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. So when Jesus comes again, it will be to judge the world, to mete out sentence according to how people lived on this earth. We are all accountable to God for what we do with our lives. And if we choose to live our lives on this earth as if there were no God, to do as we please, or if we know the Bible, not obey what we know God said we ought to do, if we want to spurn the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, to care nothing for it, to not learn about it, but to live as if we're always going to be in this fleshly body, then we must experience judgment which is a sentence into everlasting fire. But if we choose to love the truth and use this life to live for him, then heaven will be our home. We have such a short time. It doesn't make any difference how old you are or how young you are. When it comes to time, it's so brief. And it's so fleeting. And we do not know, some of you young folks, you don't know whether you're going to live to be 30 years old or 20 years old. You may be thinking that way, but there's a host of folks that have thought that way and never, never made it. I'll just pause here and interject this. Just think of the 20th century. Think of 1914 in Europe all the way through 1918. Millions and millions of young men, roughly 17, 18, 19, 20, on up into the 30s. They never got through the war. And then what do you have 20 years or so later? Same thing happens again. But not just those who were soldiers. Look at all those civilians that died, babies that died, people that were done. They had hopes and aspirations. You may think this not to be such a good idea, but I found it rather interesting. I haven't done it in a while. But just go through old graveyards and read the tombstones and stop there and look at them and realize that person was born in this world. Had all the hopes and aspirations and enjoyments and ups and downs, and bad things and good things. And yet, here he is. Of his earthly remains, this is all there is to it. And that's the way it'll be for us until the time the Lord comes back. When he comes again, he's going to punish the disobedient. That's why we started with, you who are troubled, rest with us. The Lord Jesus should be revealed as mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
it, it bothers me because you can point these things out to people who say they believe the Bible. They take God at his word. But then it comes to this, they go right on down through life, sort of acting like it'll never happen to me. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. But it will. God offers salvation only through Jesus Christ. Only through the gospel of Christ. To have the saving blood of Christ applied to us, we must humble ourselves and obey the truth, believing in Him, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Then to live faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10. The writer of Hebrews said to those people of that time, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hebrews 2 and verse 3. It is so easy to neglect the very important matters. We don't usually look at our lives as to whether they're acceptable to God in that way. We think, of, well, I don't do this this wrong, and I don't do that this wrong. But what have we neglected? What have we omitted that we ought to be doing? How have we used our lives? Be assured that Christ will render vengeance in flaming fire. 2 Thessalonians 1.8, you can't escape that. That's coming. So therefore we are to learn about mercy, grace, and being grateful to God who's given us this opportunity to be where we are. Now let's think for a moment and then the lesson's yours about being Americans and born where we've been. What is there, 330 million Americans about? I don't know the percentage of the world that is, but there's what, about six billion people on earth or a little more? And there's only, only 330 million Americans. And how did we get here and not China or India or Indonesia or Africa? There's one answer to that. There, but for the grace of God, go I. We think of the grace of God giving us forgiveness of sins through Christ. And yes, we ought to. That the way of favor is in Christ. To be favored by God is to be saved by our obedience to the gospel and to be in Christ and faithful. But do you realize how much more opportunity has been given us to be born here in America and to have what we have? And I don't mean monetary things and material things. Just to have the exposure to the Bible and nothing else. And yet we let it slip by. But we could have much more easily be born in Africa or China or someplace like that. Now the Lord knows our minds. He knows where he put us. So what do you think he's thinking? We, we don't take advantage of the grace of God to put us where we are, to have this overabundance of truth. Realize there's people all over this world right now that never have heard what I preach today in these two sermons. Never have heard it. Millions of them never have heard it. How many times have you heard it? How many times have people tried to get you to obey the gospel? Those nearest and dearest to you. How many times have you, you had your people to try to get you to be faithful now that you are a Christian? So much we don't think of. We usually think of the grace of God strictly from the standpoint of giving us the gospel, God's power to save. Well, ultimately it is. But think about the great favor of God in putting us where we are. So our duty here is to learn the truth and use our opportunities to spread the gospel, defend it, and grow as close to God as we can. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I'll return again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also, John 14, 3. So we can only end this sermon in this way as Matthew 24, 44 reads. Therefore, be ye ready. To be ready 
is to be obedient to the gospel and to live each day faithful to him. Maybe when we go home and all of us, not just saying this to you, but all of us ought to every day thank God that he has given us the great privilege, poured out blessings on us more than we can grasp, just to be born in a nation full of Bibles and the freedom to preach them and to assemble as Christians to worship him. Well, lots of places can't do it. If you're a child of God and you've sinned, we urge you to repent of those sins and pray God for forgiveness. But whatever your spiritual need, we've studied what the Bible says you need to do to be prepared when he does come. So we ask you to respond to the invitation if you need while we stand and sing.